what an honor it is to uh, fill in the big boots of Pastor Kevin, and uh, I'll uh, I'll get even with him later. But uh, how many, uh, with a show of hands, uh, don't know what I do? Oh, okay. I thought I was the only one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, um, okay, well, <laughs> I spent the last 36 years uh, working on the police department uh, in, in different capacities. I retired from the city police in 2007. I went to work, back to work in 2008 for the Ministry of Justice, and uh, I, uh, I lead a, uh, I want to call it an elite group, and if they were listening, they'd probably be really uh, amazed that I would call them elite, but... Uh, a lead group of, of men and women that uh, we target gangs and drug houses, uh, we target uh, prostitution, fortified buildings under the Safer Communities and Neighborhoods Act under, uh, under uh, SCAN legislation, which was set up by the Ministry of Justice. And I am the uh, Deputy Director for the Saskatoon office, and we look after basically Highway 16, border to border to border. And uh, so we're on the road with our unit quite a bit. Uh, and uh, in, in the meantime, I, I get a lot of time to spend with the Lord, so it, it's pretty amazing. Uh, in my years of policing, though, uh, one, of the, one of the first questions that most people would ask me after being on the SWAT team and being uh, a training officer for the Saskatoon Police Service and, and uh, uh, just the different things that I got involved with, the different units, uh, I always get asked if I've ever been shot at or if I've ever been in a high-speed chase. And my answer to that is, yeah, well, that actually happened just before I started on the police department when I asked Vic for Val's hand in marriage. So, <laughs> anyways, I wanted to uh, start my... Uh, uh, the evening off with something that I really find interesting and, and some of those things uh, that come up uh, as, you, as you read through the Word. And, and so if you have your Bibles tonight, we're going to bl blaze through a, a, a certain uh, number of scriptures. And the first one I want you to turn to, and actually you don't have to turn to it, I think maybe we can get it up on the, on the big screen, is Second uh, Chronicles uh, chapter 5 and verse 11. Now, uh, uh, Second Chronicles uh, talks about King Solomon and the building of the temple, and and that and the scripture refers to the dedication of the temple on that day. And I, want to, I, I found it interesting that there was 120 priests uh, that were present at the dedication of the temple on that day, and, and the Ark of the Covenant was brought in into the temple. Second Chronicles 5 verse 7. Now the interesting thing about the Ark of the Covenant was that man could not touch the Ark. The ark was where God resided, and he showed himself a pillar of fire by day, or by night, and, and a, a cloud by day. And during that, during that uh, time, if any man leaned up or stumbled across or, you know, adjusted his boots and put his hand on the ark, he instantly died. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forward here uh, rather quickly. Um, so no man can touch the ark and actually... Uh, when they carried the ark from place to place, they actually put two poles underneath, and there was ark bearers that were that were uh, um, tasked to carry the ark of the covenant across the country, so that God would follow the children of Israel. And uh, uh, in the, as you read through, you'll find that one guy actually stumbled with the ark and put his hand out to stop it, and he instantly died. So, Second uh, Chronicles seven verse seven says. Uh, uh, that a fire actually came down from heaven and consumed the offering. So they, they did this, this, uh, this tremendous offering unto the Lord when they're, when they're dedicating the temple, and fire came down, and not only did it consume all the offering, the, the bulls and the rams and the doves and all the things that they put on this, on this uh, altar, but it also consumed the altar itself. So now I'm going to fast forward to the day of Pentecost. There were 120 people in the upper room. And uh, Acts, uh, I believe chapter 13, talks of Acts chapter 1, verse 13, says there are 120 people in the upper room at, at the day of Pentecost, approximately, that the mother of Christ, who is the new type of the Ark of the Covenant, because she actually carried Jesus, was present at that time. 
And as you know, no man touched her uh, as well, all right, until after Jesus was actually born. Uh, and in, uh, I believe it's Acts 3, verse 2, it says that the Holy Spirit came down as tongues of fire. So does history repeat itself? Yes, it does, all right? So that's just what I found a little bit interesting. So I'm going to move on. Uh, as I said, I... I uh, been on the police department for a number of years. I was waiting as a young boy to join the RCMP and I hurt my leg and as a result I ended up going to uh, Bible school for one year where I met my wife Val. And uh, Val and I were married in 1978 so here we are 38 years later. We have uh, three beautiful kids and three uh, in-laws uh, married to them and, uh, and five grandchildren. So you know God does uh, lead and direct even back then, even when I wasn't in a position where I was going, in a position where I was able to listen as well as um, he would have liked me to. Uh, actually, uh, after being married, we uh, uh, came to that point where, for me anyways, police work was everything that I wanted to do. It was absolutely the best. I sold out to it, and actually God began to take a, a, a back a back row in my life. And uh, it wasn't that I, I didn't go to church and it wasn't that I didn't pray and it doesn't, what, was nothing of that, but it, the zeal and the excitement for the things of God just was not there. And I don't know if you, can, if you can relate with me at all, but sometimes we find ourselves in those dry desert places where we just don't hear what God is saying. And uh, even more so, we don't respond when God talks. And I learned that there was a big difference. God was talking all the time, and I just wasn't listening. He was pitching, and I wasn't catching. Police work became my focus, staying in shape, working out, all those things, until one day I walked into our house, and my wife was busy tucking the girls in, and she was kneeling beside their bed, and they were praying this little prayer, and it stuck with me ever since. And my little daughter, uh, Renee, actually was praying at three or four years old, and she said this. She said, Dear God, make, G make Daddy bold as a lion to preach the gospel. And I, it, it took the wind out of my sails, and I had to reevaluate who I was. I had to reevaluate what I was doing with my life, and was I having an impact, and was I loving people, and was I caring about people, and it, it, it gets so easy in the police department to have your heart jaded, you know, and, and turned off, and, and, and not step up and do those things that you really know you should be doing. Not out of, not out of God's going to come and, and knock you down, but just out of who I am in Christ and the position that he had given me. And so I remember this prayer, and, and over a period of time, we, we, uh, we found a church that actually supported all the things that uh, I was looking for. And God got a hold of my life, and things began to happen. And uh, I found out for the first time that policing was what I did, and that being a lover of the Lord Jesus Christ was who I really was. And if I walked in that, if I walked in that love that the Father that we sang about tonight, if I walked in that, that God would use me and take me to places that I've never been. He would give me dreams and visions, mostly dreams, because as the Bible says, old men dream dreams, right? And I love sleeping, so I get to dream lots. But the important thing is, now that you have it, what do you do with it? And the, and the mantle of uh, of the prophetic began to come into my life and I started to practice it and I knew that if I was going to speak prophetically over somebody's life that number one I needed to know the word. That was ultimately the important thing. I needed to know what the word said and then I needed to know how to prepare that word to give it at the right time and at the right season because some of you or maybe all of you have had a prophetic word or somebody come up to you and say something like, thus saith the Lord, blah, 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 right? 
And those things, those things are what stick into your spirit and those things are, give you the strength to build that foundation so that you can walk, so that you can live, so that you can have life. And when the storms come, you know how to handle them. And so I began to speak prophetically and I began to think about the prophetic and un have an understanding of the word. You can't have the prophetic without the word, but you can have the word without the prophetic. All right? If somebody's going to come and speak over your life or my life, I would like them to really have a clear understanding of what the word of God says so that I get it straight the first time. So, some of the things that I learned early was no dates and no mates. I only speak those things which I hear my father speak. And that way it, there's protection for me and the word of God as I, as I present those things. I believe that someone who's interested in the gifts of prophecy should start out there by understanding the word over their lives, taking the word that was given to them, and begin to focus on that so that they can hear what God is saying for their life first. Because it, the word, is, if you're going to be up here, if you're going to be going to church and having your ministry grow, you have to let the word impact you first. If it does not impact you, it's really difficult for it to impact somebody else. A prophetic word usually confirms what God has already told you. I mean, in probably 95% of all cases, that's the way it's going to be. Now, I've been around some prophetic people that have just stepped up and, uh, and stepped out and heard God's voice on, on things and spoke things into existence in my life based on the Spirit of God, and that's a, a totally uh, beautiful place to be. So, the other thing is you have to hear what God is saying. So I'm going to give you a quick story. And some of you have heard this story, and I'll, I'll, uh, I'll make it up to you later. My, uh, <coughs> my partner got saved at work. Shortly after God got hold of my life, my partner got saved at work, and he was driving our police car. And, uh, in the, and we were on night shift. We were working in Sutherland. And the 115th and Central, uh, anybody driven through there late, you know where it is. All of a sudden, our, Larry went to turn right, and our police car turned left. And immediately, we, uh, we felt the presence of the Lord. We, we felt God was doing something that was totally beyond our control. I know it sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, this really happened. And Larry was driving, and he's been... He's been saved or he'd been had given his heart to the Lord for two weeks. And God's hand was upon him. So if you've been a Christian a long time or you've been a Christian for one or two days, I want you to know that God's not a respecter of persons. And what he did for Larry and myself, he can do for you. And God needs people who are going to listen to what he has to say and be willing to go where he takes them. And God literally took our police car into an abandoned field, which is the city snow dump at that time. And we drove into this uh, snow dump. Our lights were out in the car, and we sort of climbed along this road. It was March. It was minus 30, and the bright moon was shining. And as we came over this one rise, we see a vehicle, and there's nobody around. And I thought, well, we've, uh, we found a stolen vehicle, or we found somebody that's, you know, Stolen property, whatever, maybe drug deal going down. So I said, Larry, I'll check the car, you, you cover me. So I get out and I approach the car and I cannot see anybody in the car. And I walk around the front of the car and as I'm looking through the front window, on the other side, on the driver's side, I see a blonde haired female sort of sit up and get into the vehicle and into the driver's seat. She has no idea that we're there. And I don't know if you've lived in Saskatchewan for more than one season, you know your tires are crunching on the snow, and there's no way that she could not have heard us. 
other than God had taken our car so strategically up behind her that she had no idea we were there. So I went around, knocked on the window, and she was very startled that somebody was there, let alone a policeman in uniform with his flashlight. I ro she rolled down the window. I said, I need your license registration. Do you have it? She said, yeah, absolutely. She handed it to me. Larry came out. I handed him the information. He went to do the computer check. And I sat there, and I'm looking. I'm trying to figure out what is this woman what is this lady, what is this young woman doing out here at this time of the night? It was uh, after midnight. I don't remember the exact time. So I said, uh, can, you, can you tell me, can you tell me what you're doing? And she said something really amazing to me. She said, do you want the truth? Uh, I go, okay. I said, tell me the truth. And she said, I'm sick. My cue. Have you had anybody pray for you? Um, I think my mom does. Wow. I said, thank God for praying mothers. And if you are a mom and you've been praying for your daughter or you're believing for your daughter or you have a daughter out there and it's cold and she doesn't know where to turn, and she needs to come home, keep praying. Keep praying. Keep praying. And she said, I think maybe my mom does. I said, no, uh, I was a little more forceful, I was a little more bolder at that point. I said, no, have you had anybody lay hands on you and pray for your healing? No. And all of a sudden it started to sink in that she's talking to a cop and her eyes got like huge. I said, do you think it would be okay if we prayed for you? And she said, yeah. I said, okay, get out of the car. So she gets up and she, uh, I said, now raise your hands like I'm arresting you. She did. And she puts her hands up. Larry and I go over and we start praying for her. We pray for her healing. And then I stop in the middle of it and I say, have you ever given your heart to the Lord? Have you ever made him Lord of your life? And she said, no, I haven't. I said, would you like to? Said, oh, yeah. And out there, in the middle of that field, this gal who was bulimic got prayed for, and gave her heart to the Lord, and God took our police car right there because Larry and I had dedicated ourselves to hearing God's voice and be willing to go where he wanted us to go. She gave her heart to the Lord and she just melted. She broke down and she just started weeping uncontrollably to the point where I, I said, are you, are you okay? What's wrong? And she said, no. She said, you, you wouldn't understand. Uh, try me. She said, well, she said, I've been coming out here to this secluded spot night after night, week after week. And she said, I, I've sat here and I look up at the moon tonight and she said, I remembered my, my mom and my grandparents talking about God and I just cried out. I said, God, tonight, if you're real, send somebody. And it was that moment that God took our car and drove it right up to her. So God, tonight, if you're real, get it? God, tonight, if you're real, I can't settle that issue for you, only you can. I'm not the healer, he is. I'm not the deliverer, he is. I'm telling you, whatever you need, whatever you need, whatever your need, God, if you're real, send somebody. And that's the commission of the church. And that's how we should play this game. And that's how we should do life. God, if you're real, send somebody, send me. Here am I, send me. 
we always wait on the pastor or people who can sing and, and lead us to, to do, the, do those things that God's calling us to do as a, as a church body. And, as, and, and if this church body captures that, captures it and settles it in your heart, that number one, God is real, and that he does want to use us, and that he can use us, send somebody. Send somebody. Thank you, Lord. The Lord has given me a, 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 a setup, I guess, for a prophetic word that I want to give to the church in a few minutes. But if you have uh, your Bible, 2 Chronicles 20, verse 20, we turn there. The army of Judah was, uh, was being led by Jehoshaphat, and they were out in the wilderness, and, and, and they had just finished six or seven battles in succession, and they come to uh, a place where they, uh, they heard that eight or nine other armies had, had uh, decided that they were going to come and do battle against Judah, against the, 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 the Israelis. And Jehoshaphat is leading. He says, in the morning they got up early and they went out to, to the wilderness of Tico. And as they were about to go out, Jehoshaphat stood and said these words. He said, hear me, Judah. And you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God. That's number one. Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. So whatever it is that you're believing for tonight, Believe in the Lord your God and you will be established. This is the word of the Lord for you tonight. If you believe in him, you will be established and your families. And also if you believe in the prophet, in the words that have been spoken over your life by the prophetic, I want you to go back and revisit them because they are important words that need to come forth and need to be set uh, set up in your life as foundational principles along with the word of God that's going to establish you going forward from this day forth. But believe in the, in the prophets and you will succeed. That's the word of the Lord. You will succeed. Not maybe, not might. You will succeed. Whatever you set your hand to, the word of the Lord has promised you that you will succeed. If you go back and do those things that that you remember, that you, you, you sort of, yeah, well, uh, I didn't really, I wasn't ready for it, or whatever. I, um, whatever reasoning we have, whatever life dilemmas we have faced and have tried to steal this prophetic word out of our life, I say enough. Enough. Let's get it back. Let's get it back in the name of Jesus. So I'm going to tell you this. Number one, check your heart. Just check your heart right now. Just say, Lord, where am I at? Check your heart. You, you, you guys have been in church a long time. And there's, there's such a wealth of, of church stuff here, of word, of circumstances that you have seen God overcome that people need to hear about where you have prayed for someone and you've seen life begin again, where you have, you have uh, beaten down the door of the enemy and you kicked it in and you've taken captive those things that had come against you and you've utterly seen it destroyed by the Spirit of God in your own life, and you know it. How God provided. Maybe it was just a tank of gas, but God provided. Maybe it was... A, maybe it was your child came and joined you in church one night. You know, maybe it was just something simple, but it, it spoke to you and it set a foundation that the enemy cannot overcome and not override. Get it back, church. Get it back. Number two, believe that prophetic word that was spoken. Go back and remember it. Grab a hold of it. Dust it off. Dust off our Bibles. Get hungry for God. Get hungry for the Word again. Be encouraged to step out as God has intended us to do that.
So this is a prophetic word that I have for the church. The church has gone through, has gone through the transition phase. God's word is really going to step up into the measure of fullness of things that are about to happen inside the church. The Lord God by his spirit is going to pour out of his hand of refreshing that will impact this entire city. He will come into the church and he will walk these aisles and he will rub shoulders with you. He is looking for men and women who will worship again in spirit and in truth. He is coming to you. He is coming to you you will stand up, you will rise up, and you will declare those spo the spoken word, the word of the Lord, the rhema word, over this city, but more importantly, over your own life. And over your own circumstances. And you will have the breakthrough that God has given you already in the spirit realm. How do I know this? This prophetic word is founded in the scripture. We turn to Ezekiel 21, verse 27. It says this. Overturn. Up here it says ruin. In my Bible it says overturn. Overturn. I will overturn it, saith the Lord. And it shall be no more. And to him whose right it is, when he comes to that place, I will give it to him. Whose right is it? The Bible says in Ephesians 2.10, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has preordained that we should walk in it. The timing of things is as important as the word itself. 2 Corinthians 5.16-21, let's read that. From now on then, we do not know anyone in a purely human way, even if we had known Christ in a purely human way. Yet now we no longer know him like that. Verse 17. Now everything is from God who reconciled us. All right? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and look, new things have already come. Verse 18. Now everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them. Now get that. God was reconciling the world to himself and he was not counting our sins or our trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of reconciliation to us. Verse 20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, certain that God is appealing through us. We plead on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. Verse 21, he made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, mm. so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Overturn, overturn, I will overturn it, saith the Lord. And it shall be no more. Hmm. And to him whose right it is. I just told you, you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. This verse is for you. You have a right. You have a right. You have a right. And God is going to overturn those things. Whether bad debt, bad loans, bad relationships, broken homes, broken marriages... Whatever it is, God is going to overturn it for you because you have a right. You were created the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Second Corinthians, or pardon me, 1 Corinthians 1.30 says, Now wisdom and righteousness belong to you. Wisdom and righteousness belong to you. It's not something that you earn, church. It's not something that you can buy your way into. It has been given to you by the Spirit of God in the moment that you said, Lord, I make you Lord of my life. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. Now get this. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Philippians 3, verse 4. 
Hebrews 12, 11 says, talks about the correction which comes from the Lord as, we, as, as he leads us and directs us. He says, no, don't go here, go here. Do this, don't do this, and so on. It's not always pleasant, but here, here's what happens is that it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness in our lives, of which we do, cannot earn. We cannot, all we have to do is accept it. Isaiah 32, 17 says, the work of righteousness shall be peace, but the effect of that peace or that righteousness in your life will be quietness and assurance forever. So if your life is noisy, you can use it as a sounding board. If you're too busy, if you just don't hear all the time, then maybe it's time to understand that we have a God who's already deposited into our hearts and into our spirit that righteousness which leads us into peace and the effect of that will be quietness and assurance. I don't know about you, I need that. I need that quiet time and I need the assurance that the things that I'm doing are things that I've heard God ask me to do. I need the assurance that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I've declared that for years over my family. Some of us are busy just trying to figure everything out. We're running to and fro, and we get lost in the, in the hurried things of life. Wisdom and righteousness belong to you. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Therefore, this is your right to have quietness and insurance. And if you don't have it, then you need to go back and revisit these scriptures and begin to understand that righteousness was just given to you. There's nothing you could have ever done to earn that. You become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So what stops us? Um, you know, sometimes we love to perform in the church. But I want you to know tonight, the performance evaluation in the church stops. And we become family. We don't need to perform for anybody any longer. When we perform, that's when men and women get hurt, jaded, Disappointed, visions and dreams get broken and shattered. And ultimately, there's a falling away or a pulling away because, why? Because usually we put our trust in man and not him who made us. Proverbs 29, 25 says, the fear, excuse me, the fear of man puts a snare into our lives, but whosoever uh, trusts in the Lord shall be safe. The fear of man. You know, uh, there was a, uh, a long time, I, I had to struggle with that, you know, the fear of man. And, and uh, when God got a hold of my life, it was, I no longer cared what men thought of me. I really didn't. I, I, I realized I was looking for work when I got the job on the police department, and I, would, I could easily look for work again. But when God got a hold of me, there was a boldness and a confidence that came into my life that nobody can ever take away. Fear of man was gone. Fear of man was gone. How does it happen? Well, a lot of it has to do with Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 for me. I had to learn how to walk by faith. And I want to encourage you to do the same thing tonight. I want you to grab a hold of the words that that have been spoken over your life uh, with regards to you being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And unless we see it, we sometimes don't want to believe it. We sort of have that Thomas mentality. Lord, unless I can, unless I can touch it, unless I can see the, the, the scars in your hand, uh, I, I can't really believe. But tonight by faith, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things which we do not see. And there was a lot of things that I had no idea that God was going to do in my life when I said, yes, let's go, I'm all in, I'm sold out. The incident that I relayed to you was just one of many, many incidents. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, it is the evidence of things which we see not. 
I have uh, a couple of other scriptures here. Before I, uh, uh, there's some, some of you I, I have a word for that's the Lord just burning inside of me here. So just bear with me for a moment. But I was, uh, I was looking at the scriptures in Genesis and uh, it talked uh, in Genesis 1, it says, it talked about the, the growing seasons and it always kind of, I always skimmed over it really fast. But it actually says in, in Genesis 1 and I believe verse 3, it says, uh, it's 3 or 13 now, I can't remember. I don't have it written down. But it talks about how God uh, divided the, the waters, uh, set the dry ground, and then it goes on to say that in the midst of the dry ground, he caused the fruit trees and all, all the plants and everything to spring up and produce after their kind and talks about the seed, right? But the next verse goes on and it talks about how God made the sun and the moon. And I had to stop and think about how that would impact some of the farmers around here if uh, they realized that they could actually grow crops without the sun and the moon uh, because God did that. And that's the kind of God that we serve. I mean, uh, things were sort of backwards there, and I, I, I tried to figure it out. And maybe uh, because God can do as he pleases, Psalm 25, verse 1 says, God does as he pleases. He didn't ask me for permission to put the stars in the sky and the moon in the sky. But I wanted to uh, just uh, throw that at you tonight. That, uh, God has a calling on each of our lives. He has an, an anointing that he has given to us that goes with his calling to, to do those things that he's asked us to do that, that we, um, I long for the supernatural. I long for God to continue to drive my, my vehicles or to take Val and I to places where we can minister to people and pray for people. That's where our heart is. And uh, I want to encourage you tonight. I want you to know that you have that same gifting. You have that same ability within you. You have the ability to minister to people. You have the ability to walk in love. You have the ability to step out and see people healed and set free and delivered because that's the calling that is upon our lives and upon this church. And that's going to cause this church to grow and we're going to see people come here with all kinds of issues and, and circumstances and we're going to see them delivered and we're going to see them set free we're going to see them walk the aisles and give their hearts to Jesus not only that, not only are we going to see them but the Bible says we're going to see the rest of their families come in behind them and we need to be ready as foundational people to just take that and, and go forward that has given us